Welcome, everyone, to the Woody Kincaid Let's Run.com Track Talk Podcast. Yes, Woody Kincaid has run 12.58 for 5,000 meters. The Diamond League is in the books. Bridget Koskai has run fast. Vin Lanana is back. Christian Coleman and his dad, who may be listening to this podcast, are in the news. The number one Japanese team has raced the number one American team in cross country. Claudia Lane is back. More importantly, the Dallas Cowboys and the New England Patriots are both steamrolling to a Super Bowl matchup. And I am joined by Wetron.com chief ace staff writer, Jonathan Galt, Patriots fan. Jonathan, welcome. Yeah, good to be here. Well done. The the Patriots and the Cowboys actually play later in this season, so we might have to talk exclusively football that week. But for this week, there's just too much to talk about. I mean, you mentioned all the stuff. I don't even know. This thing might go three hours. Like, I think we have to start with Woody Kincaid, though, right? Yes, we do, of course. But we first must bring in the other member of the podcast. And we have no Antonio Brown talk today, everyone, unfortunately. But I am joined by, quote, an unprofessional, irresponsible hack, and an idiot, Letron.com co-founder, Robert Johnson. Welcome to the show. Good to be here, guys. Uh, what a week. Uh, I, would, I guess I should consider it a career highlight. I come back from vacation, hop on the podcast, and next thing I know, like I'm a, the father of the world's fastest human is bashing me on the world-famous message boards. Proof positive, folks, that the message boards are famous and that everyone, all the pros, listen and read our stuff, including their parents. So, crazy. I mean, I, I was worried last week coming back from vacation that I might say something controversial. I was really afraid it would be on the transgender area, but uh, <laughs> wasn't expecting this. I mean, I, I did say in the podcast last week, like, how screwed up the modern world is. I, I don't understand this. Like, what did I say that was so irresponsible, unprofessional, hack, and idiot? I basically, I, all I said was that a person who missed three drug tests in a 12-month calendar period, should be drug tested every day for the rest of the year, and then I added for the rest of their career. And I stand by that. Kudos to a proud father that wants to defend his son, but I never called him a doper. I said he needs to be drug tested so that people don't have doubt, because the sport is so ridiculous. There's been so many dr- drug cheats over the years that why not drug test them every day? Well, it's interesting you say that, Robert, because this morning, Wednesday morning, Christian Coleman actually posted on Instagram, these are his first extended comments about the USADA case that wasn't. And he said, it's simply disrespectful when fake fans speculate and talk about drugs in relation to the great athletes we have in this sport. And then he mentioned he literally doesn't take any supplements or protein powders, nothing uh, to help with recovery. And then he went on to say, uh, there have been a lot of inaccurate things said in the media over the past few weeks. It's a shame we live in the world a world where clicks equal money, yet people still believe everything they read. And my reaction, the first thing he said, it's simply disrespectful when fake fans speculate and talk about drugs in relation to the great athletes we have in this sport. I, I, gr- I mean, to a point, I agree it's kind of annoying that we have to have that discussion, but here's the fact. You look at the list of the fastest 100-meter men in history – and it's littered with people who have been suspended or banned from the sport outright for doping. I, I think it's a conversation we have to have, unfortunately, but that's the the way the sport is. And there's a reason you're not supposed to miss three drug tests, because th- we've shown that in-competition testing isn't very good, and the only way we're going to co- ca- catch someone for drugs is testing them out of competition. So, Christian Coleman, if you don't want this speculation, don't miss three drug tests. And as for Robert's comments and the dad, I, th- I thought it was great, his dad, uh, I think it's Seth Coleman, is that correct, was defending Christian, and it makes me more likely to think he's clean. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm suspicious of everyone, but I'm like, okay, his dad's really defending him. This is cool. And Robert, you reached out. And we said, hey, Mr. Coleman, you want to come on the con- podcast and talk? I think his dad, if, if someone's, if you're saying, hey, drug test his son every day, it's, there's kind of a, maybe some suspicion there. I think you're, from your perspective, it's like, hey, if you're clean, just show it. Take a test every day. And sure, it's invasive. Maybe that's really not practical. And the other thing I thought was pretty funny, you, you compared it to Kevin Hetzel, who essentially was a coach who slept with one of his athletes. As, but as Kevin pointed out, I didn't sleep with all of them. So just because you flunked the drug test, I mean, didn't flunk a drug test doesn't mean you won't flunk one in the future. Like passing a drug test means nothing. And you just used a humorous way to say that. But do we need any more Christian Coleman talk or can we get to Woody Kincaid talk? Yeah, let's talk to that about the race that took place uh, in the middle of the woods at midnight Eastern time 
that was behind a paywall on runner space. I mean, how I don't understand how anyone in America could have missed this race. John, John, don't try to justify yourself. This is vindication for my boy, Jerry Shoemaker. Jerry, I love you. I've always got your back. And the good versus evil, the Nike versus, or I guess Nike versus Nike, the Civil War, Alberto versus the Bowerman Track Club. Jerry Shoemaker vindicated by never racing his guys. He doesn't, well, I guess technically, John, you don't even view it as a race. Well, no, first of all, it was a glorified time trial. It was really, really, really impressive glorified time trial, but you essentially had no, there was no strategy or anything like that. It was just everyone sits behind Amos Bartos Maya for a mile, then everyone sits behind Mohamed for the two miles, and then the last like 800, you know, it, it was kind of a race at the end. But there was no lead changes or any strategy or any sort of thing. It was just get the standard. And it was impre- incredibly impressive. They ran 12.58 for Woody Kincaid, then 13 flat for LeMong and Matthew Centrowitz. But to me, I view this as the perfect... Woody Kincaid's 12.58 is the perfect encapsulation of Jerry Schumacher as a coach this year. He produces... He gets an athlete who has battled injuries, and give a lot of credit to Woody for this as well, for overcoming them. He gets an athlete who was pretty overlooked coming out of college to run an astounding performance. He's now faster than Galen Rupp, than Bob Kennedy the Matthew Tagan camp, I mean, then some really fantastic American runners. But at the same time, Jerry Schumacher also has a 1258 guy who was top three at USA's, and that guy's not going to Worlds, and he's not going because he didn't race a lot. So I think his critics and his fans, Jerry Schumacher's critics and his fans are both going to have something to say. They're going to say, hey, this guy's amazing. Look at what Jerry did. Look at the coaching job. They're also going to say, yeah, but he's not going to Worlds. Well said. I mean, I, I think that's fair. I mean, I, I thought you, you you posted that right on the message board right after the race, and and I thought that was accurate. But part of this also is because USATF doesn't let didn't let the U.S. athletes chase, so we can partially blame them. So he's not leaving anything for chance for next year. They've got the standard out of the way for the uh, Olympics, but it also shows you just how how, much, how fast people can run in perfect conditions with perfect rabbiting. To me, w- w- one of the un the biggest un Harold person here is Mo Ahmed. I mean, how far did he rabbit in this race, John? I think he dropped off with a lap or two to go. I mean, he went almost all the way. So, you know, and, and just, I think if you look back, you know, earlier in the season when they didn't get the standard at the Azusa Pacific meet, what bothered me about that race was I was like, is, with the resources they have, they didn't have very good rabbiting. I'm like, why did they have a rabbit, you know, hire some Kenyan guy to show up and, and take it farther? Because, you know, but this also shows you at some level why these standards are stupid, because, here you have a guy that clearly can get the standard. He just doesn't have it at the time of USA's, and he's not going to Worlds as a result. So they need to figure out a way to honor the top three at USA's, if at all possible, in every event. This result, though, was so shocking. I woke up and saw some tweet, and it's like, essentially along the lines of Bowerman men bring it at whatever this thing was called. And I was I remember thinking, like, hey, I wonder what that means. And then I clicked on it, and I saw Woody Kincaid 1258, and I was just like, what? It was like when Tegan, when uh, Selensky ran 2659. I mean, pr- this is probably actually more shocking. But Woody Kincaid, and I remember, I swear at some point, it was before USA's this year, but I remember thinking like, hey, what happened to that guy? And we were kind of talking about Bowerman guys. I'm like, what happened? They had, you know, that other guy in there, Kincaid. Like, what the hell has he been up to? So in 2016, I remember going to actually a Portland Track Festival meet. He wasn't signed by anyone yet. I think he got second in that meet. And he he might have been fifth at NCAs that year, and I'm like, oh, this guy looks decent. And then he joined Bowerman and pretty much has only raced indoors. Uh, I think in 2017 he ran 13, 12 or 13, 14. Well, he got second at USA indoors of that year as well. Behind when the the one that Chalimo just ran away from it, Woody won the kick for second. He beat Ryan Hill. And then he didn't pretty much race at all last year indoors. You kind of completely forgot about him. And then this year took one shot at a race outdoors before USA's, didn't get the standard. And at USA's, his race actually was very impressive. They went out very hard the first 600. I think they were sub-60 and, and you know about 130 at 600. And, you know, this guy, I'm like, what the hell is Woody Kincaid doing up there? Usually you go out that hard, you're not like an A-plus caliber runner. You fade by the end. And he came back and got third. And I, I was like, okay, well, he beat all these other guys. That was pretty good, but, you know, no one expected this 1258. Definitely surprising. In some ways, it kind of surprised – he reminds reminded me a little bit of Cholimo a couple of years ago. He was third at USA's, right? And then he ended up being the big gun at, at Worlds, although Willie Woody won't be going to, to Worlds. 
And the question I have, folks, is last week Weldon introduced a, a, a term, and I'm sure it's probably caused some angst amongst these shoe marketing executives, the JV runner term, folks. And we've basically determined that you're a JV runner if you're not on the world championship team. So most runners in America are JV runners. But does Woody consider it? Do we consider him still a JV runner? Can you become a, can you can be considered a varsity runner if you break like 13 flat or 330? And get top three at USA's like well, what do you think? You're the official arbiter of these labels. Very good question. I think he's still on the JV. I think 13. So you go sub 13. You should get maybe elevated to the varsity. This is the stupidest debate I've ever heard. He ran 1258. Yeah, he's a varsity. He's like a super varsity runner. This is ridiculous. This is kind of like hitting 65 homers at AAA. It's like yeah, it's impressive, but. Uh, 1258 is 1258. I'm, I'm interested. Okay, there are two other guys in this race, by the way. I think we should talk about them for a second. Lopez Lemong, second in 13 flat. That's a seven second PR. Matthew Sensowitz, third in 13 flat. That's a 20 second PR. Let's talk about Lemong first. We had this debate. Do we now think he's a medal threat in the 10K at Worlds? We had this debate off air, and Weldon and I laughed when John said that. Absolutely not. Absolutely not, John. John thinks he's – John, just please embarrass yourself and tell us why you think he's a metal threat at Worlds. All right. Well, I watched him run USA's, and he ran like 27.30 in that race, absolutely destroyed everyone, just looked like it was totally easy for him. He just came out and ran 13 flat, which is you know about the same PR as most of these guys he's going to be competing against in the 10K at Worlds. I don't think – that if it's a sub-27 race or like a 27 flat race like it's been in the last few years, that he's going to be meddling. I don't know if he can handle that, but I think if the winning time is, you know, like it was at USA, he's 27 third or slower, this guy, we know he can kick. We know he has a, you know, he's started out as an 800, 1500 runner. We know he has a big time kick. If he can just be there with a lap to go, I think he's a chance, but the big that's the big issue for him is if it's the pace dude goes too fast i don't know if he has the strength john let me make this real simple to you 13 flat who cares first of all you don't think that hegos gabriel can run 13 flat uh yomif kajelsa can run 13 flat ronix caprudo can run 13 flat these guys no no, no no you're conflating my argument here though robert this gets him in the club like to medal in the 10k you have to be able to do that we now know he can do that and the other argument John made off here was, oh, Emily Infeld four years ago. I mean, she comes. Would anyone have thought Emily Infeld could have medaled in the 10K at Worlds? No. I don't want to disparage women's 10,000 meter running, especially in, in weak years when it's not an Olympic year. But come on, we're not going to compare men's running to women's running. It's not nearly as deep. The world is much more sexist. It's a lot harder to do on the men's side than the women's side. That's point number one. And, and, and point number two is, Here's the bit. Let's just make this real simple. He just lost to Woody Kincaid. A guy who lost to Woody Kincaid is not winning a medal at Worlds. I guess, yes, you can see if they all go out and they blow up. And I mean, he lost to a guy who ran 1258. I mean, Woody Kincaid, if before this, you would say, oh, okay, but he lost to a 1258 guy. Here's the other thing. Look, I, when I look down the list of guys who are running the Worlds, it's probably going to be Ronex Kipruto, it's going to be Hagos Gebrewet. It's going to be Joshua Chapter guy. It, Lamont's probably not going to beat those guys, but I think as a dark horse medal contender, I'm I'm still thinking there's a chance. Okay, guys, what do you think Woody would have run in the Diamond League meet? I mean, you're saying he's a 1258 guy. Correct, he is a 1258 guy. But say this is the Brussels Diamond League. What sort of time do you think he runs in that one? That's a good point. I mean, I I I always say people can run. You know, Ben True ran thirteen oh thirteen oh two at Stanford. He's never equal that in the Diamond League. Same thing with Hassan Mead thirteen oh two at Stanford, and he's never equal that in the Diamond League. But they have run close to that. I think True's other, his his next best PR is thirteen oh five. Mead's run thirteen oh four. So I, I think you add need to add at least a couple seconds. You got to fight for position. The rabbiting's not going to be perfect. Normally the weather isn't as good as this. So I I think he would probably. <sighs> Be just over 13 minutes. Yeah, I mean, all right, here's the the Diamond League final was in Zurich. Joshua Chepta guy won it in 1257. You had Gebrewet second, 1258. Then Nicholas Camelli of Kenya, 1259. 
Then you had Yomif Kajelcho was back in sixth, and thirteen oh one Stanley Way Tharker in thirteen oh six. So I think he probably would have been in that you know seventh place range, maybe a little bit after Kajelcho. You know, Woody does have a big kick, but I still we don't have proof you can kick against those top guys in the, in the you know Diamond League. And let's move on to Matthew Centrowitz, third place in this race. Big PR for him as well. I think this is a great sign for Centro. He he had some comments after the race, essentially saying to Ken Go. And uh, I think Emery Moore as well. He mentioned in Beijing at the Worlds four years ago, he got beat by Abdel- Abdelhadi Aguida. He was Abdelhadi was third, and Centro was eighth. He didn't run that well, even though he'd been racing that well. Re- he's been racing really well in the Diamond League circuit that summer. And Centro was like, I need to get stronger because he saw Aguida ran twelve fifty nine a few weeks ago and uh, later in the Diamond League final. He and he knew he couldn't do that, so he basically told Jerry, Hey. Train me like a 5K guy for August, and then September will start sharpening up. And looks like right now he's a pretty good 5K guy. Yeah, and I think he was specifically saying that because I think that year there was three races in four days. I think sometimes it's three races over five days. So three, there will be three races in four days this year, and he thinks you need to be especially strong there. I had big hopes for Centro because I thought you know he had a limited buildup getting into USA's. He almost beat Ingles. I'm like, he's got plenty of time to train. If he's healthy, I expected him all along to be a big medal threat, and this proves it to me. He should be in the hunt for a medal, um, you know, and at Worlds in Doha in a couple weeks. Um, you know, it's interesting to me though. You know, we're talking about Centro. Some now, including him, I think, right, John, are talking about running the 5,000 next year? No, let's stop that. Let, let's stop this stupidity. Of We're always wanting to move people up. I mean, I was reading the message board. A, a poster by the name of that average runner was like, this is incredible, still imp- impressive, especially from Centro. You know, this is the the problem of our sport. We're always, the guy that finishes third, we're talking about him instead of the guys that finished first and second. Yes, it's a good sign, but I still think he's a long way off from being able to compete in the 5,000 for the Olympics. He needs a 100% focus on the 1,500 next year. Well, I don't think he's a long way off, uh, but I think that, yeah, it's re- look, this guy is the Olympic champion. He is a tremendous tactical 1,500 meter runner. Why would he, what What point is there to moving up? Like you only, there's only reason he should be moving up is if he's no longer competitive in the 1500 and certainly doesn't look like that's the case. It'd be ludicrous. And here's the other thing. He, he w- barely, he, he was the third Bowman track club athlete in this three person. Well, there was a few guys way back, but like he was the third Bowman track club athlete in this race. And then you're expecting him to get third in the Olympics or better. Like, come on. He's the Olympic champion. This is not simple. Stay in the 1500 until you can't race it anymore. But I think if anyone can move up to the 5K, it might be Centrowitz. Coming out of high school, I remember his freshman year at Oregon. There were all the Oregon guys killing it. I think Weeding and I don't know who uh, who was it. I sort of like Centro was like the third best 1500 meter guy on the team, maybe fourth or fifth. And I remember somebody, some Oregon guy out there, was telling me he's like, "Oh, you know, I think Centro is going to be the best miler." And I wish I could give this guy credit. And I sort of laughed in his face. I was like. Ugh. What? Who are you kidding? You know, his dad was a 5K runner. He's made for the 5K. You know, fast forward a few years, egg is on my face. Centro is the Olympic gold medalist at 1,500 meters. But he's never really shown anything at 5,000, really, until this year. And now his PR has improved. You know, I don't even know how much. So I thought this one was very encouraging to me. The other thing that I think it's good for is hopefully now the rest of the Americans sort of raise their sights. I, you know, to be competitive in the world class, you got to be able to go sub thirteen. So everyone else, Drew Hunter, you got to run, how to figure out how to run sub thirteen. Now this is perfect conditions, blah blah blah. But this is clearly possible for a lot of Americans, and you know maybe we shouldn't be so shocked they ran twelve forty four last year. Um, so it, it'll be interesting. As for Lopez meddling at worlds i don't think it's happening he, he's just so big you think a guy like that can i mean he shocked me with everything he's done this year i don't think he'd run a fast 10k he's done it he's now run 13 minutes for 5k but metal at 10k not happening he's big what lopez lamong you worry about how big he is how is that relevant craig Mottram modeled at metal at worlds he's big i just feel like there's a certain body type for the 10k I don't know. The farther you're running, the less you want to be carrying around. But clearly, this means Lopez Lamont has shocked me so many times this year. He'll probably go out and win like a gold medal. So good luck, Lopez. All right, gents. I think that should wrap up a discussion. No. Weldon, Robert, you got something to say? Yeah, I mean, to, to me, 
one, one thing we got to bring up our Alberto Salazar segment, and this is when I'm going to bring it in here. First of all, how bothered do you think Salazar was there watching this? He and Jerry do not like each other. They don't get along. I think they barely speak, if at all speak. And they used to be, you know, teammates. But I think, well, I don't know. I think some of the things probably that Alberta was doing probably made the Schumacher group uncomfortable and they had a split. Um, I think also when, when Zelensky got that American record from Rupp, that probably did it too. But I, I want to know really, was Alberto there? If anybody was there and you saw Alberto, please let me know. I imagine he skipped this one. But to see... Woody Kincaid with a better lifetime 5,000 meter PR than Galen Rupp. Does that bother him? Or does he think, Hey, I've got the, the Olympic medals. You know what I'm saying? But this, I was already thinking about this last week. Has Salazar. Okay. Go ahead, John. I was just going to say, no, he doesn't give a shit. And you know why? Galen Rupp has two Olympic medals and Alberto Salazar just has three diamond league titles this season. He was over in Europe at the real races while Jerry was out racing themselves. Out racing the JV races, John. Come on, say it. Put Woody Kincaid back on the JV. Never. Woody, you're a varsity runner in my eyes, and you always will be. Okay, but John's praising Alberta for all the Diamond League champions. But I was thinking about this even before last week, and I was thinking of it in terms of Josh Thompson, but it applies to Woody Kincaid. Has Alberto Salazar ever developed someone like a Josh Thompson or a Woody Kincaid? These weren't even NCAA champions. And now they're making Worlds team. Well, neither one's actually making a Worlds team. Roberto, you got me there. But they're become American elites, and they weren't even the top of the collegiate scene. And now they're at that level. And I was thinking, you know what? Roberto's kind of really never done that. Um, he's now just going for the cream. But then I thought about it, and I'm like, Roberto doesn't give a sh- Can I say, can I cuss Walden on this podcast? I already cussed. I, I already uh, broke the barrier, so go ahead. Alberto doesn't give a shit about developing someone to finish third at USA's. I, I guess back in the day, he did have someone like Amy Yoder Begley making the Olympic team. But he, Alberto, he wants to win medals. He's not giving a shit about making the U.S. team and being a sort of, you know, third team, third, third placer at USA's. He's getting the world's best athletes. And now they're all coming to him. So it's kind of easy. I mean, but it, it's interesting. I mean, the development uh, of these guys is quite good by Jerry. So it's just an, I think that they're going for different things. Um, uh, Jerry seems to be a little bit under the Mark Wetmore thing of not wanting to import the talent, even though he does coach Canadians and, you know, it's not like he doesn't recruit athletes. So, yeah, I think two things you said interesting there, Robert. Um, one, yeah, Alberto, he's not coaching up like these wannabes from the NCAA ranks, but at the same time, Mo Farah, Mo Farah was not, he was an also ran at the global level when Salazar started coaching him and he turned in, him into the most dominant distance runner in the entire world. So, Got to give him some credit for coaching up Mo, but also I, Jerry Schumacher's talent identification. I mean, some of these guys, Woody Kincaid, Shelby Houlihan was an NCAA champion in college, but I don't think anyone thought she would be as good as she was. Josh Thompson. I mean, I'm sure he has a couple miss swings and misses on his record, but Jerry, some of these recent athletes, I mean, just an outstanding track record of identifying these guys and then developing them. I, you know, you have to give him a lot of credit for that. So shall we move on to the varsity races? We did have a second Diamond League final last week in Brussels, and we had another another American champion in the 800 meters. I mean, this was an, an amazing race for the U.S. We had RJ Wilson winning it, Raven Rogers second, U.S. now sending four people to world. Sierra Brown can say thank you to RJ for getting her an extra spot. But it seems like some of us at Let's Run maybe weren't as impressed with this performance as uh, as others. Robert, what did you have to think about this race? God, John's trying to really make me put out the controversial comments. I mean, I was expecting pushback for some other stuff I said last week, but not the Coleman stuff. Now, after the Women's 800, I just thought, is the Women's 800 now the boringest event, mid D, certainly the boringest mid D and distance event in all of track and field? Like, two flat wins a Diamond League meet? Are you kidding? Nobody can break two flat? I know it was a little bit windy. And AG, it's the same thing, everything. AG wins, but it's not a fast time. And I, I can't believe to say this because I, I like non-rabbited races, but it just seems like the quality of the event is completely gone. I mean, I, I'm not going to be begging for Crestor Semina to come back. Don't get me to go, going there. But I, it just seems kind of shocking to me. I mean, uh, what was it like before, like in the year or two before Semina? Where I guess there was a lot of doped-up Russians. So I guess, you know, yeah, 158, 159 is pretty much world-class in this event. This is what it was like in 2015 or 2014 before Semenya came back onto the scene. You know, Eunice Sum was winning a lot of these Diamond Leagues, and there were a couple fast times here or there, but two, winning a Diamond League with 159 and two flat was not uncommon. 
right? And even if you go farther back to Pamela Jolimo, who when she was running 154, it would not surprise me if it came out that she also was in a similar situation as as these XYDSD women. So I, I guess you're right, John. Yeah, I think it's just, and here's the other thing. When Semenya's running, they raise the bar for everyone else. So she goes out and runs 154 or 155, and then you've got RJ Wilson running 155 or 156 with fa- you know a fair amount of regularity. And without that woman to chase, it's just so much harder to run those times. But RJ, I mean, she looks totally unstoppable. I think she has to be... She's got to be one of the biggest American favorites for gold. It's certainly in the distance events, but maybe even all the events outside of, maybe, you know, on the women's side. Okay, I guess Coleman and Lyles, they're also big favorites. But I think in the distance events, she's got to be our best bet at a medal, right? Oh, without a doubt. The, the question I have is, you know, I keep waiting for her to, to lose a race. I was thinking, oh, well, she probably I mean, thinks she's going to win. She's eventually going to lose. I thought maybe she'd lose this race. She wins by 0.43 of a second, which is a lot in the 800. I mean, so John, you're very confident. You don't think there's any chance she loses. Uh, I mean, th- there's always a chance, especially in 800. But she just she, her record. She's won, lost like one race to a non DSD athlete over the last three years. I just don't. And we know what she's going to do. She tried to do in in Brussels. She went to the front, and Lindsay Sharp tried to fight her for the lead in the first 200. She tried to throw a wrench in her game plan. RJ was just, no, I'm actually just going to run away from you. Uh, you know, you're not going to get the lead. I'm going to control this race. And that's exactly what she did. So I guess my question, Weldon, to you, one and a half medals for the United States in the women's 800, over or under? Well, um, I'm going to go over. I guess I'm putting a lot of belief in Raven Rogers or Hannah Green. One of them would have to medal. I mean, I could easily see Aj not winning. I shouldn't say easily, like you said, because she's won you know every race but one versus these non DSD athletes. But I'm kind of like with Robert in the Robert camp. Like when you just sort of see like the winning time and it's over two minutes, you're just kind of like, what's going on here? Like uh, I'm just like, well, somebody can run 158, they'll beat him at Worlds, and it's maybe not that easy. You got to control the race and that sort of stuff. But this event seems like uh, she might be a bit vulnerable which is maybe crazy to think because she just wins every single time out. But when the time isn't that super fast and people have run faster than that time, I think it's sort of human nature to think, well, hey, well, somebody can run faster than that, therefore they can beat her. But the way she's running the race, they're not beating her. Yeah. Well, I mean, remember, Hannah Green went 158 when she ran in Paris. I mean, Ajay will run what it takes to win, and it just didn't take that fast to win in Brussels. Robert, over or under one and a half medals for the U.S. women in the 800 at Worlds? I'll go with over two. We're not getting all three. I'm mean, just trying to think who else could win this thing. I mean, winning Nan, Nan Yondo of Uganda was right behind Raven Rogers in the Diamond League final. Um, you know, there aren't that many. Uh, I mean, here's the question I have for you guys is, if Safan Hassan ran the 800, how fast could she run? Well, here's the thing. We know she's run 156, but it's the same situation as RJ Wilson. I think she needs someone towing her out there. Uh, but... Well, actually, what did she close in for her 800 in the mile world record? That had to be pretty fast. Um, I think she'd be a content. I think Ajay would beat her, but she'd be. I think she could get a medal at Worlds. We say Ajay hasn't run that fast this year. She did run 157.7 in Monaco and win 157.7 at USA's and win. So she can control the different type of races. Maybe I should have just chalk up the gold medal to her, but that's gold medals aren't easy, right? So. I mean, even like Sifan Hassan, you're going to give her the gold medals? Like, there's a reason these races are run. So I'm excited that Worlds still isn't here. I mean, we got so much to look forward to. It's great to have a late, great Worlds. I agree with you. Let's talk about Sifan Hassan. She dominates the 5,000, runs 1426, wins by like three seconds, um, more than three seconds. And Helena Berry had nothing to show at all in the last lap. 1433, only fourth place. And this, we talked about this last week. What does Hassan now do? We thought if she had a dominant win or a win here, she had, she would do the 10,000, 5,000. John, do you think that's what she'll do? end up doing? I think that's the best option for her. After looking at, you know, the 10,000, Ayana has been the woman to beat the last few years, but she hasn't raced. I'm assuming she's still injured, of course, in London 2017. She just showed up out of the woodwork and destroyed everyone. So maybe she is fit, but... Yeah, I think tank. It just drives me insane. 
that the 1500 5k is not available. This is a double that Laura Buell ran in London 2017. It's a double that Sifan Hassan ran at London 2017. Genzebe Dababa ran it at Worlds in 2015. Why the IAAF would make the schedule in such a way so that these two finals are like 10 minutes apart is just ludicrous. But yeah, I think 10... I think she should double, and ten fifteen is really the the only. I mean, she could do ten five. I don't. I don't think she should do ten five. I think ten fifteen. Wait, you think she's going to do ten fifteen? I think that's what I would pick. I think Salazar isn't afraid to take on aggressive doubles. I think that's the one I'd want to see her do. I think that's what she's going to do. That's going to be amazing if she do it. Legendary status if she does it. Then we'll have to put we're going to, whichever event she doesn't do the fifteen hundred or five thousand. We need to put an asterisk next to the winner's name. Because Saban Hassan would have won that, and that, that's you know that's a big thing. Like think about it: if she does the ten five, and you're Shelby Houlihan or you're Laura Muir, oh my God, Jenny Simpson, you just got a gift. You got a huge gift. You know, it's kind of like arbitrary. Like we decided that there's three medalists, and those people are the ones we celebrate. What if there was four medalists? You know, I mean, it's kind of interesting how this all plays out. And someone skips your event, it's it's a heck of a lot easier. But Hassan has just been you know unreal all season long moving to the men's side i want to talk about the men's steeple getting at wiley and ethiopian has won i guess it's only appropriate because the kenyans have been horrific in this event all year the event that they have owned for eternity uh, the top kenyan was only fourth benjamin kaigan but getting at wiley uh, of ethiopia wins in 806.92 just over uh, El Bacali of Morocco, who for like what the third year in a row just misses out in the Diamond League title. Controversial finish though. Wiley had the lead coming off the final barrier. Uh, El Bacali has a great finish. He started moving up on him. Wiley goes out to like lane three or four, puts his arm out, and makes contact. People sort of misunderstood what I wrote on the message board. There was no DQ, and I said I like it when they don't DQ people. Like I didn't want, but I think the more I thought about this, that needs to be a DQ, John. I agree, Robert. I I watched it live and i thought that's a dq and then i watched the replay and i was like eh, it wasn't as bad as i thought but then i read the rhetoric of the rule and it's if you're obstructing or jostling someone and that that's a dq and wale threw el bacali's form off i mean you could tell i think right at the very end of the race el bacali sort of gave up because he knew he was beat but he caused El Bacali to throw his arm out and basically make sure he wasn't cutting him off anymore he went from the middle of lane one to the outside of lane three by the finish line. I, there's just no reason to do that. I think he obstructed him. I think it should have been a DQ. What I really want though is I want a rule change because I, I the more I thought about it, I was like, look, you can't just block. You can't run out to lane four, put your arm out and block a dude right at the finish line. That, But to me, a DQ is too much of a penalty. Like I don't want him to get no prize money. What, second place is 20 grand, right? I don't want him to just get nothing. I think there should be a way that you move them back to second place. Horse racing rules. They have this in horse racing. I, I agree with you. That's the fix. Because he would have gotten second, have Wale second, El Bacali first, and if you don't want to get moved down, don't foul someone at the finish line. Let him, yet another brilliant idea from Let's Run.com's Rojo. You're truly... There's the, One more other thing I was saying about the Woody Kincaid race. There's so many races we need to have. I say we need to have the Let's Run time trial at the end of the season. This time of year, you put it like at the end of the season... At Stanford or Portland, hey, now we have the, now we have the location, Nike's campus, but people can run so fast. There's so many interesting things that we could do to the sport. If people like the time trials, well, let's do it at the end of the season when they're actually in shape. I think the steeple, though, it probably should be a DQ. But I thought I think it's kind of great. It's like when kids are racing on a playground and they're veering in front of each other and doing everything to possibly win. But if that's not a DQ, like stepping on the line in the steeple shouldn't be a DQ either. I mean, like. Some of these rules, okay, one, if we're going to follow the letter of the rules as they're written, we need to follow the letter of the rules as written everywhere, but certain times we need to change the letter of the law so that, you know, if you inadvertently step on a line in a 3,000-meter race, you're not immediately disqualified. Yeah, I, I think, well, then one point you made, the, the veering out, I do feel for these guys because it is kind of natural instinct when you're in a close race to do anything possible. It's like fight or flight, basically, to hold your position. And so these guys might not be intending to do something malicious by blocking someone off. It just may be desperate desperation. They're not th they're thinking, I need to be in first when I get to the finish line, and their body just sort of automatically starts drifting out. And as an athlete, I think you have to train yourself to fight that. But I can kind of understand. I don't think it means they're a, a malicious athlete, necessarily. It's just... That's their natural instinct is to protect their position. 
Okay, a little sprint talk. Is Noah Lyles in jeopardy at Worlds? You know, when I watched this race, so he won the Diamond League final, but it wasn't a convincing victory. I mean, normally you watch it and it's over with about 150 to go. It's just like, okay, this is done. This one, Noah Lyles wins it in 1974. World champ Ramel Guliev had his best run of the year in 1986. Then Andre de Grasse, his fastest run since the 2016 Olympics. He runs 1987 for third. And watching it, I was like, yeah, Lyles didn't look amazing. But then you got to add up some of the other things. Okay, so it was pretty chilly. I don't think Lyles really liked that. Obviously, you know, it's chilly for everyone in the race. Then the other thing, he was basically, do you guys know, he was holding it in for the entire race. He, on the start line, he basically fa- realized, oh man, I really have to go to the bathroom. And so I think he said he was uh, clenching his butt cheeks the whole way or something like, he was clenching something the entire race and not particularly comfortable way for him to run. So uh, I, I think he's still the favorite, but it was pretty interesting. Was this in our recap? I mean, we need to have an article on this. Speaking of clickbait, we don't even have to talk about Christian Coleman or his dad. Like, holy shit, literally, we got to get on this. I had not heard this either, John. Is this a a Jonathan Galt exclusive? How did you know that he was holding his butt cheeks in during the Diamond League final? Well, he tweeted about it. I I don't know. Hold on. Let me see. I'm not sure if holding his butt cheeks was the uh, exact phrasing, but let me go back and see what his... I'm scrolling through his Twitter account here to find out what he said. All right, guys, here is the tweet. It's from September 6th, which was the day of the race. Noah Lyle says, No lie, I was clenching my butt the whole time. Upside down, smiley face. So there's your investigative journalism. Thank you, John, for that. That was very important. So are you you guys worried at all about this run by Lyles? Or you think it's just... I mean, he still ran 19-7 and won. He just didn't totally destroy everyone like usual. I'm not worried if I know he had a good excuse for only winning by .13, which is still a decent margin, so... Not worried. He will be your 200-meter world champion. One distance race we haven't talked about at Worlds. And maybe it's because we knew who was going to win it. Timothy Chariot. I mean, the guy is a machine on the Diamond League circuit. Wins convincingly by 1.4 seconds. Over the Ingenbertson brothers, 2-3. Jacob, 331, who crushed Philip, 333. But American Craig Ingalls becomes the first American to get the Olympic standard. We still do not know how USATF is going to be picking the team for next year. This is a joke that we don't know this. I don't understand what is taking them so long to figure this out. Like, everybody knows they should honor the world ranking system if they can. This is stupidity. Craig Ingalls, 334.04 for fifth place. More important, I think fifth place is pretty good for him. And then I want to give a shout out to one of the JV runners. I don't think anyone's even, this guy didn't get any love in the message board or anything. And he used to be a varsity runner. Johnny Gregoric, one of the few A6 pros, gets eighth place, 335.32. So just off the Olympic standard. But that probably you know fast enough to hopefully get him into the Olympics next year if the USATF does on world rankings. Because eighth in the Diamond League final is going to help you. This is crazy to me, though. This whole JV runner thing is off, off the rails at this point, guys. Just so you're not... A- if you don't make a world championship team, you're just automatically a JV runner. Like Johnny Gregoric has run a 349 mile this year. He was a world championship finalist in 2017. He was eighth in the Diamond League final. He beat Samuel Tefera, who broke the world indoor record this year as the world indoor champion. Yeah, he's on the JV squad. I don't get it. Now, I guess he's in the Diamond League final, and he has been on a world's team before. So well, I consider him a major leaguer, I guess. Definitely. Well, then, can we get a ruling? I don't know. Gregoric, Fifth Avenue Mile was like near last place just afterwards. Two days after his race, and he flew over from Europe two days earlier. Well, you know, when you're one of those 4A players, it's tough. Sometimes you're feeling good. You get to the majors. You hit a couple homers. Diamond League final, he was varsity. But then the European track season was over. Well, I guess we had the match. We can talk about that next. But then he flew back. You know, Fifth Avenue is sort of the celebration, traditional end of the year, fun for everyone. But I think that's when his demotion to the minor leagues began. So hopefully he can get back next year. Speaking of the race, like Robert said, Timothy Chariot won it. I mean, Jacob Ingebrigtsen, every time I watch this guy race, I'm just so thoroughly impressed by his clothes and just everything about him, his poise, his running form. It's terrific. But Timothy Chariot is just so damn good. And I think, I know he's got some, you know, he's missed a silver medal at the Global Championships, but... I just I'm, I watch him on the Diamond League. I'm like, how is why can't he just do that in the Diamond League final? Like he did it. In, sorry, in the World Championship final, he did it in 2017. and He dropped everyone but Elijah Manigoy. 
I just don't see how he doesn't do it again. But maybe after three rounds and four days, Jakob, who has the you know 5K background now, European 5K champion, maybe he has enough to, to get him at the end. But I still think Chariot just, it's very hard to see him losing in Doha. Well, good point, John. The 5,000, Centroid says it's key to have that strength. It's hard to lead. I mean, you, you have to, there's no rabbits. You got to break the wind. Although the big stadiums are normally not that much wind. But yeah, it should be interesting. I, mean, I think he's the big favorite, but until you've won a world title, you you are not a world champion. So Jakob's doubling back from the 5K, though. You got to remember that. So that'll be his fifth race of the championships. So will be the 1500 final, including prelims. Yeah. Normally I want three people to double, but well, it's going to be fascinating to watch him in the 5,000. I don't think he has a big shot there, but who knows? The guy keeps just impressing. Let's talk a little bit about the Fifth Avenue, though. Jenny Simpson wins on the women's side, as always. Very close by Eleanor Puria. She pushed her. You know, Puria is looking great for Worlds. Um, she's going to be running the 5,000 there. Mark Coogan told me or early in the year that he thought Puria could break four minutes in the 1,500 next year, and it looks like she can. 4.16. One and 4.16.2 for the two of them. They were way ahead of everybody else. I mean, 4.22 was third place. Nikki Hiltz, only 4.25. Not a good sign for Worlds, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a great race for us. She's been racing. I guess the one thing about Nikki is she's been racing. We criticized Bauman for not racing that much. Nikki has been racing a lot, which I love to see, and she's been winning a lot. She won the Pan Am title. You do wonder, this is her first year really racing this deep into the season, first global championship how much will she have left in Doha? But I'm not going to write her off based on, you know, a fourth place finish uh, at Fifth Ave. And in the men's race, our my favorite 35 plus runner, Nick Willis, age 36, who has been struggling uh, quite a lot this year, wins the race 351 7, very narrowly over Chris O'Hare. And Nick, after the race, I thought these comments were fascinating. It's been a challenging season for me, and it was hard to stay motivated. There were several times this year where I was like, is it really worth the sacrifice anymore? Is it really worth the. Yeah, typo by in, in the article. But today actually says that it is, and it's going to ha- give me another reason, another lease on life for Tokyo 11 months from now. Nick, please stay motivated. The Olympics, you can get that third medal. It would be an unreal accomplishment if you could do it. This will clearly be your last Olympics at 37, I would think. So, But great to see him doing well. And, you know, I, John doesn't like the JV varsity thing, but what you see here is basically a varsity runner beating up on all the JV kids. I mean, only one or two other guys in that in that field had ever made a world's team, and Nick, despite struggling, still shows he's better than them all. Well, Nick doesn't have the world championship standard this year, Robert. He wasn't even certain he was going to make the world championship team. Are you sure he's not a JV runner? John, when the start list come out, I'm confident that my boy Nick Willis will be on them. So you'll see. I'll be proven correct. Yeah, also the rule is if you win an Olympic medal, you by def- by definition, you're not a JV runner. So, I mean, it's ridiculous to have that conversation. We have one more piece of news out from Fifth Avenue. Robert, did you hear Jenny Simpson's comments prior to Fifth Avenue about steeplechase? I guess that's a no. Here's a little segment for you, Robert. I asked Jenny if she might return to the steeple, you know, next year or something. That's what I'm saying. We should have started the podcast with that. I, I'm, I'm depressed. I was riding sky high. Seth Coleman calls me out. I reach a new level of, of fame and prominence in the world. And now one of the world's all-time great 1500 meter runners does not listening to me. Jenny, I have 10 years of college coaching experience. Well, well folks, we see athletes change their mind. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not giving up on this. We see athletes change their mind all the time. When she gets her butt spanked, Without Safan Hassan in the 1500 at Worlds, then she'll see, she'll listen to me. She, reality will hit her. Well, I'm telling you, as Robert mansplains over here, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next year. I'm going to get to the New Balance Indoor Grand Prix in January. We're going to have a press conference the two days before the race. Jay Simpson's going to be there, and Robert's going to tell me, hey, ask her about the steeplechase. Because this happens every year. I've asked it like pro- I've asked that question to her multiple times. And it's always the same. It's like, oh, it's not really my plans. I'm not interested in it. Then some picture's going to come out on Instagram that she's running over a hurdle in practice. That's going to get this new cycle going again. So I don't think this is the last time she's going to have to answer that question. I guess I realize I'm a hypocrite because I'm getting mad at people about people trying to push Centro to the 5,000. Yet I've been trying to do this with Jenny for like half a decade at least. So Total hypocrite. I thought Jenny said some interesting stuff because essentially I said the 15 has been kind of crazy this year. And she said, yeah, it has. You know, people are running really fast. And 
I asked her, like, well, I'm like, you broke four pretty early. And she said, yes, I did. I think that was in Rabat. But she said, look, I have the luxury. She's won a gold medal. She's like, I can just focus solely 100% exclusively on Worlds. So she made it sound like, you know, she's primed and ready. Been If anyone can get ready for a World Championships in October, which is when the 1,500-meter final is, it'll be her. She said it's been a very weird year. You know, now she's back, and she's under coach Mark Wetmore, the Colorado coach, and she helps out there. And usually the college kids come back, and it's kind of an easy, fun period for her. And she's now really just cranking up, getting ready for Worlds. So we still got to see how people are going to be running in September and October, which makes this world very interesting. Yeah, now speaking of Worlds, we did have an international competition earlier this week, Monday and Tuesday, from Minsk, Belarus. It was the match, Europe versus the United States. Europe got the team victory uh, with, I don't even know what the actual score was. I don't know. I mean, did people, I guess my question to you guys, did you watch any of this meet? Did you care about this meet at all? It was on national television for six hours, correct? Unfortunately, I must confess, my parents were in town on Monday. I, I, I seen the baby. I did not watch it. I had no excuses for not watching yesterday. It has had what we've people have been demanding, a team score. It's like the Ryder Cup for track. I did not watch it. I think both of you guys did. What did you think of it? Could this be the savior for track and field? Well, I have to confess as well, I did not watch any yesterday as well. I watched a little the day before. And it, it, I think just the whole thing is very interesting, right? It's six hours of national television because NBCSN, I mean, they were agreed, I think, to partner with this and put it on. But it's on from like 12 to 3 on a Monday and Tuesday. And I guess we've shown with Champions League soccer that, you know, weekday sports can get an audience here in the United States. But meanwhile, this meets on. There's, it was an American B team, by and large. Allison Felix did run season's best, which was good. Josh Thompson won, but he's not going to be at Worlds. I mean, a lot of people aren't going to be at Worlds who are running. You'd have four Americans in every event, so you're going to have more people here than at the Worlds to begin with. But the other thing is, the Diamond League final was not on TV. We have the Olympic Channel now and NBCSN, and you can't get the meet on. I didn't check what was on the Olympic Channel, but when Brussels was on, NASCAR qualifying was on NBCSN. Okay, I get it. That gets bigger ratings, maybe, so bump the Diamond League final, but... How about putting the Diamond League final at least on the live Olympic channel? Like, what's the point of having the Olympic channel if you're not going to make use of it? It's just sort of crazy that, like, what gets on TV, what gets six hours, this team thing. I don't know. I, I can't tell you how riveting the team thing was yesterday because I, I didn't see it, unfortunately. But that's maybe a problem if – I think the concept is great, but you got to get the A team to show up and compete. The Ryder Cup is great. The Davis Cup is great if you have the best people in the world competing in it. But – if for whatever the incentives are such, it was 7,000 euros for first place. So I'm sure like in the hammer throw, the guys are banging it to be there. But in the 1,500 guys are like, nah, I'm going to get ready for Worlds. Does anyone really care about the Davis Cup? I know the Ryder Cup's awesome. I don't really give a shit about the Davis Cup. Do we, Does anyone know who won the Davis Cup or when it is this year? I don't know anything about it. But I think I did watch the meet. I watched it on Monday. I didn't watch it on Tuesday. And... I thought there were some good races. The men's 1500 was terrific. I mean, I know the U.S. didn't have... They had Ben Blankenship, who is going to Worlds. Josh Thompson was in there. Jake Whiteman and Charlie Grice from the U.K. I mean, I thought it was a terrific race, and Josh Thompson ran down Jake Whiteman at the finish. That was really exciting. There are a few other decent races. I mean, Kate Grace won the 1500 yesterday in a PR 402. But the one thing I just thought was three hours is... That's a lot to ask from a fan base to watch a track and field meet. I mean, I know football games are three hours and people watch that, but there's stuff happening in football like track. I don't know if you if you're someone who wants to sit through you know two hours of field events, that's fine. That's your jam. I'm not really interested in sitting around watching every single attempt at the women's pole vault. So I thought it was too mi- too much time in between the track events. Three hours just. Sc- Scratch it down to like two, if it's a two-day meet, an hour and a half. I mean, I know Diamond Leagues, I think, need to be two hours, but this meet in this format, three is, is too much. I'd like to talk a little bit about that men's 1500, John. I didn't see it, but Whiteman beat Grice, right? So the British selectors are vindicated. Grice has run 330. He finished fourth at their trials, or f- I think fourth. 
whereas Whiteman was third. He'd only run 334 in the year. They picked Whiteman to make the team. They only had to select the top two. The third was up for their discretion. Whiteman beats him now. So, again, I've offered to coach Mr. Grice to prominence, to Olympic glory next year. So, Charlie, uh, if you've run 330, I, I, I can figure out a way for you to beat Jake Whiteman. Don't worry about this. So give me a call, 844-LET'S-RUN. What One thing I think that proves, though, Robert, so Grice has run faster than Whiteman this year, but he's beaten him in the two championship-style races they've raced. This is why USATF should allow, one of the many reasons why USATF should have allowed chasing standards, because Josh Thompson, he gets third at USA's in a championship final. He is running great on the circuit right now. He's red hot. But because and he took four, look, he's not someone who didn't race at all. He took four shots at the U.S. Stand, at the World Standard earlier this year. Well, he ran four fifteen hundreds, and none of them were fast enough. Like even the winners of those races, none of them got the standard in those races. And he's not someone who can just hop in a diamond league anytime he wants. So for him to say, for USATF to just say, yes, yeah, sorry, these races that you were entered in didn't go fast enough, and you don't get to go to Worlds, even though there's two months before the World Championships. It's just ridiculous because he's he's a guy I think who right now could make a world championship final and who knows once he's in the final what could happen. And instead, he's going to have to be watching it from his couch. Yep, Jerry should probably set up a time trial for him so he can bang out that Olympic standard since USATF will not tell us how they're going to be picking this team for next year. Robert gave out the phone number. We're only halfway in. We haven't even mentioned a sponsor. So guys, Floyd the Leadville, you want certified CBD products? Go to floydtheleadville.com. Now, guys, I'm not sure if you guys heard this. CBD was in the news. Did you guys hear anything about CBD this week in athletes? There was an athlete who got banned, and I think she it was a triathlete. She had to retire from the sport because she got popped for a, a tainted CBD cream or something? Yes, correct. Lauren Gose, um tested positive for THC, and she said it was from a cream that she was rubbing on herself for recovery, a CBD cream. And there's a thread on the message board. People are talking about this. And they're like, oh, my gosh, how can Let's Run have CBD products on there? They're illegal. And we'll follow up more with this on on the website because I reached out to Floyd's. And I was like, hey, are you guys aware of this? What's going on? And the selling point of Floyd's is that their products are, C- are certified CBD products. They're, you know, they test. You, you get what's in the bottle. You know, that's what they say. It's like, hey, we're we say we're. THC free, we're THC free. So with Floyd's, I reached out to them. They wrote me back, and they pointed out that like they have some completely THC THC free products. So they have CBD and no THC. So you know that's I think a selling point for Floyd's. I'm going to follow up with them on that as well. If you want to save fifteen percent on these products, go to Floyd'sLevel.com. Use code Let's Run. But also, like, if you're an elite athlete and you're taking, like, THC products, like, she was saying church wasn't supposed to have THC in it. That's what, one, you need to have certified products. But if you're a pro, it's very different what, you know, kind of stuff I think you should be taking, like, just in general. Like, Christian Coleman's like, I don't take supplements. I think just if you're a pro and your living is on it, you better be really certain. Because some people in the message board were saying, oh, bullshit, she's probably smoking weed. The amount she tested positive couldn't come from a cream, blah, 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 blah. So there's all these theories out there. But I think it's just sort of a reminder for people. One, if you're taking a supplement, you better know what's in there. So you better – you want to be buying your supplements from obviously reputable people. So we're going to follow up with this with Floyd's, but the fact that they say, look, we have certified CBD products, as we've always said, and they also say, look, we have THC products. These products are THC, and these are full spectrum, which means they have THC. So you can get CBD with THC or without it. So all this thing is pretty interesting because, I don't know, like CBD and THC, all this stuff, is it's kind of crossing over. I see it at the pharmacy here, all this other stuff. It's kind of you know a new realm. And then there's the whole general question of like, why is weed even banned like how performance enhancing is weed to begin with like should you saw to be saving its money on tests because each drug test costs money don't test for stuff that really isn't like hardcore performance enhancing but anyway yeah i don't understand why they're bothering we're supposed to be stopping performance enhancing drugs if she smoke wants to smoke weed or rub it in her who cares the, the usada the anti-doping water they need to they need to go the hardcore cheats stop banning these people for three months for stuff that no one cares about some stipulant. Go for the hardcore stuff and only bring in big cases that are actually real suspensions. Don't taint someone's name with something that's of no consequence. 
Okay, guys, let's move on. We talked a lot about professional track and field, but it's NCAA cross-country season now, and we have a lot of topics to hit. I'm going to give you your choice. We've got the Jap- Japan's number one versus America's number one showdown in Flagstaff. We've got Johns Hopkins beating Georgetown. We've got the debut of two-time footlocker champion Claudia Lane, and we've got Vin Lanana returning to the coaching ranks, taking over the director of track and field position at the University of Virginia. Robert, which one of those storylines interests you the most? Go. NAU versus Tokai University. I've wanted to see this for years. We've always raved about the depth of the Japanese collegiate system and the even professional system, how deep their, their particular college teams are. I mean, my God, it's amazing. And it, it was an amazing story. NAU, the, who's won the NCAA cross-country title, what, two or three years in a row, they open up their standard home meet, which is normally a, a, a glorified jogathon. People don't realize, folks, you need to have a meet within 21 days of your of your athletes coming back to campus. So that's why all these teams have meets where they, you know, don't run fast and just you have to have a competition. It's an excuse to get back to campus earlier. So they have this meet, and, and a few days before the meet, the Tokai University. I mean, how cool is this? A Japanese team is altitude training in the United States. Like that's how serious they take their distance running over there. And they're coached by Seguro Sako's high school coach. This guy's a legend over there. He had great high school race. He's kind of like their Bill Aris. He had great high school success, and then he moves to the pro ranks, I mean, to the collegiate ranks, and he's, had, he's built this team up from scratch, basically. He loves to have his own cross-country course where they, they run like a 1,000-meter loop over and over and over in practice. It's crazy. And he just says they hop in the race. And in the end, NAU won 25-30. to 30. I still don't think we've had the answer as to who would win a real cross-country race. I think American teams probably would because we seem to be better at the shorter distances. But we don't know like who's more in a base phase now, who's taking this less seriously. But fascinating thing. Great to see them battle each other and enjoy. enjoy the, there's a, a group photo afterwards. Amazing. I want to see what Brett Lorner of Japanese Running News thinks about this race. I'm sure he'll offer some excuse. But victory for America, collegiate system one, Japan zero. Yeah, I, I thought it was awesome that this race actually happened. Mike Smith, the NAU coach, I was talking to him, and I'm like, so how did this come about? And he's like, well, we wanted to get them together. We wanted to do a workout or a long run together, and it turns out the NAU doesn't really hammer their long runs, and Tokai right now was doing some progression long run. So that wasn't going to work out. And then he sort of threw out like, oh, yeah, we have this home meet as well. And then he gets a WhatsApp message a few days later, and it's like, yeah, we'll run the race. And... He's like, oh, shoot. So then he's sort of scrambling to get a course map prepped. And, uh, you know, I have an article on this on Let's Run.com that you can read. But essentially, like, Mike Smith's plan, usually he just has his guys tempo the first few miles of this race and then kick it in at the end. And his instructions, they had a pacer. And he, his instructions were for the pacer to go between 5.10 and 5.20 for the first mile and for no one to pass him from the NAU team. But then Tokai had two guys who go out in the low 440s at altitude. That That's fast. You know, it's a 4.5 mile race, so not a full 8K, but that is still at altitude is, is very quick. And the NAU pacer essentially got carried away. And so all the NAU guys followed them and they came through the big pack in 448. And that was just a suffer fest for the last few miles. But it turned out, you know, it was a legit race. These guys were going, going hard and trying to race each other to win. So Really fun uh, day out. I think great for any spectators who were in Flagstaff for it. And yeah, USA, I don't think any of the flag, the NAU guys are really claiming bragging rights. They know that it's early in the season for both squads, but still a really cool opportunity. And it would be great one day to see NAU or another top US team go over and maybe run an Ekaden, maybe the, one of the shorter Ekadens because the, the Hakone one is mostly half marathon distance, but the, the Izumo Ekaden in, in October is shorter i think the longest legs about 10.2k so that might be more in the u.s wheelhouse so props to any you and tokai for not being afraid to actually race exciting there and that's the the sort of positive college cross country so there's a couple negative stories here and john dartmouth alum You've got a two-time Footlocker camp- champion on campus, Claudia Lane. She committed to Dartmouth last year. I was thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing. But she was struggling in her last couple of years of high school, and she has run her first college race, and it didn't really go well. She was 10th on the Dartmouth team. So not really a surprise. I mean, to me, I, I, I would have said this you know, six months ago, and I'll say it now. I'm glad to see that she's running college cross country. I think that she... 
I hope that she enjoys her experience. I think it's good that she went to a non-scholarship school. You know, um, there'll be no pressure for her, but I, I really don't expect her to return to elite status. Do you? I don't, but I really don't know enough about her to make an accurate judgment. I mean, I know last year, her track season, we had that race where she sort of fell off the track and DNF'd, and we sort of debated that one. But, you know, I... I don't know what her health is like, what her mental state of mind is like. I'm glad she's racing. Like you said, I hope she enjoys it. I'm not expecting big things, but she has she clearly has talent. You know, if she if she gets back to the level she was two years ago, she's gonna be competitive in the NCAA, but who knows? I'm not gonna speculate on her future when I don't know enough about it. And moving on to another story, folks. I saw this blurb in the in the Baltimore Sun, my hometown paper. It was a small blurb. They had a cross country thing. It said Johns Hopkins won the Mount St. Mary's cross country meet, defeating Georgetown by one point, thirty eight to thirty nine. I was like, what? A Division three school. Johns Hopkins. The women are, are annually competing and winning, oftentimes Division three titles. I know they've won like at least three titles. I think in recent years. And they did take down D1 power, power Georgetown, 38 to 39. And I was like, oh my God, this is embarrassing. But on the men's side, it wasn't even close, folks. Johns Hopkins, 24, Georgetown, 91. And then I sort of started to look into it. And the guys, this is, again, this is a problem with our sport. Like, nobody races. You, you go to the Georgetown press release and and the coaches, Coach uh, Brandon Bonzi, the men's coach, and I think this is a nice opener for the men. The goal was to run together as a group, and they did a great job of that. We had six guys finish all together. So they had six guys get crushed by a Division three school. And, and they probably weren't even their varsity guys. It's probably their mid-D guys. It's just to get in the, the meet 21 days before. So why even put out a press release? You know, the coach on the women's side, the head of the program overall is Julie Coley, an Olympian. And she also um, said we had a great outing today, accomplishing all the goals we set out for the early season opener. Um, so, and then she says, you know, they're going to run a more complete squad. So they obviously were sitting sitting out like all of their people. But to me, it just shows you the problem our sport has. Like everything is practiced until the end of the season. Like people don't race. Bowerman Track Club doesn't race. You know, and I don't blame them. Weldon didn't race. Weldon used to hop into Stanford 10Ks and run the first four miles and then drop out on purpose. So I don't think there is a solution to this. You can't force people to have a reg- treat the regular season, you know, as a big deal. It's just it is what it is. So you know, uh, any comments, Weldon? I mean, it sounds shocking on the surface, yeah. But then once you started talking about it, I'm like, oh, I bet you it's a B team. They probably weren't trying, you know, and then pretty much that's what happened. Yeah, even at the high school, even at the college level, right? It's all about getting ready for the end of the season and the way running works. Unless there's some sort of qualification process, the other stuff really doesn't matter. You know, in high school, I guess the districts, the regionals, that matters because you have to get the state. In college, the regional meet matters because you got to get the NCAs. Conference meet matters because there's a title on the line. But besides that, it does not matter how you do at all in these other things. There's no penalty for performing poorly. So, you know, what are you going to do? Professionally, I think money is your lever, but the problem is are we, you can't treat every event equally, right? Because a 100-meter star is going to want some huge appearance fee to show up. and whereas you, So you throw seven grand in prize money out to a hammer thrower. They're like doing backflips to get to that meet. And the 100 guys are like, yes, yeah, so I'm going to skip it. 400 guys are like, yeah, I'm going to skip it too. So I wonder why Allison Felix ran the match. If she got some side appearance funny or she just wanted to race to see where she was before Worlds and for her schedule, it'd be kind of interesting to know because Allison Felix doesn't go to track meet for cheap usually. One thing I want to say about the Georgetown thing, I mean, I don't know if they ran an A or B squad, but they're not quite the powerhouse they used to be. If you look, the women haven't made NCAA since 2015. The men missed it the last two years. You know, this used to be a perennial NCAA contender or they were at the meet every year so they, they've dropped off a little bit the last couple of years but I, I'm not you know I can't tell how much to read into this results because you don't it's so early in the season but I do know one perennial NCAA contender and that is Vin Lanana's teams Lanana John back in the day at Dartmouth before you were born had the NCAA runner-up no scholarships twice two years in a row 86 and 87 oh wow then he moves on to Stanford Multiple time NCAA champions in cross country. Then he goes to Uncle Phil's backyard, University of Oregon, cross country and track titles there. And 
While doing that, he also gets the Olympic trials back in Eugene, gets the worlds in Eugene, indoors and outdoors, and seems to have a very comfortable life there. Quits coaching, but is still an athletic director. And sh- this shocked me. Out of the blue, Vin Lanana, now the director of track and field and athletics at the University of Virginia. Well, not athletics. He's the director of track and field and cross country. He's an associate athletic director. But yeah, I was totally surprised. I didn't think, you know, Vin is 66 years old. I kind of assumed he was done with coaching. I mean, he's accomplished pretty much everything a coach can. He's won in Sidley Cross with two different schools. He built up Oregon into this, you know, rebuilt Oregon. He built up Stanford. T- tremendous success at Dartmouth. I mean, he's everything he touches pretty much turns to gold apart from the Track Town Summer Series. So he he's obviously a great coach. My question now, I guess, is how how hands on is he in this? Is he going to be in the distance coach? Is he going to keep on Jason Dunn? And you know, does he really like? I, I'm assuming because he's taking this job, he really wants to see this rebuilding effort through and build Virginia up into a top tier program. And I think. You know, I think the question is, can he? I, I believe in him. I think he's had so much success everywhere. I think he's got a chance, but uh, it's it's fair to wonder. I think, of course, he can. He's been successful wherever he goes, so I, I don't understand why he wouldn't be successful here. Um, you know, it does take a lot of work to, to be successful as a Division One coach. You have to recruit, even if you have underlings. He's good at, at delegating, and I'm sure he'll have a number of coaches doing it. But he is a master salesman. I mean, he he's and a good coach. I think he'll find it harder than the mid '80s when there was a lot of bad coaches out there. I think that the, that the biggest thing thinks the internet is most of the coaches know their X's and O's, so you have to, you know, you don't have a huge coaching advantage like you would have 30 years ago. But um, you know, he still can recruit with the best of them. He's a great salesman. I, I think he can get big talent. And UVA is a wonderful school. You know, you have Stanford and the academics. I mean, UVA is not the equal of Stanford from an academic standpoint. But short of the Ivy League schools, it's basically one of the best state schools in the country. Um, I think you'll be able to recruit a, a high-quality kid there. Um, so I, I don't see why he wouldn't be successful. I don't think anyone's going to get these runs like Arkansas did in, in the 80s and 90s. You know, I, I think it's, it's a lot harder. There's a lot more teams trying now. And also, nowadays, everyone has perfect information. Back in the day, you, you might be the only person who had the Canadian national results, you know, or the Kansas State meet results. Now it's instantly accessible on the internet. So, it's, you know, there aren't that many diamonds in the rough that you can find. Um, but I, I, this is interesting to me. The ACC, th- this is the worst. This is bad news for two people. One, Syracuse University. Two, UNC. Syracuse has been rocking at such a high level. They've been winning everything. They were crushing Georgetown when they were in the Big East. They moved to the ACC. They're winning the titles all the year. And then I think last year they finally lost, right, John? Who beat them? Notre Dame. Notre Dame, which is turning into a powerhouse. Bad for Notre Dame as well. The ACC has gotten super competitive all of a sudden. What happens? Vin's former um, runner, right, Miltonburg? Chris Miltonburg, he wasn't a runner for Vin. He went to Georgetown. Georgetown guy. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I was I was thinking of Stanford. <laughs> he coaches Stanford, but you got Miltonburg leave Stanford, go to UNC. So he he's like, okay, yeah, it's going to be us in Syracuse, maybe Notre Dame. The three of us can battle it out in the ACC. And now you have a fourth team. There, th- this is going to be sick. The ACC is going to be like the best. The ACC sucks at so like football. Oh my god, they're terrible. Well, they have Clemson. No, well, other than Clemson, they're pretty bad. And but. In cross country, this is going to be a six at conference, and it'll be really interesting to see who comes out on top. But I, I think this is going to be, you know, maybe no one can dominate it. It's going to be a battle between those three or four schools, you know, and it'll be interesting to see who 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 is consistently on top. But I assume at, at, at UVA, he's going to want to go for the track titles and be well rounded. I mean, they already have the, the doping throws coach there, and that's where they've been getting most of their national points. So it'll be interesting to see if he keeps him on there. Or if he tries to go all in on distance. Well, yeah, Robert, it's interesting. You said like no one's dominating anymore. I mean, NAU has won three straight national titles. They rank number one again. They're, they've got a dynasty going right now in Flagstaff. I think you can dominate. It's just really, really hard. Thank you, John. Thank you. I was about to say, NAU has won three straight titles. Arkansas has 11 NCAA titles ever. It's sort of interesting. They won two out of three years. They won three out of four years one time. Then they won f- four in a row. Then they won had a two off years. Then they won three in a row, and that's it. So uh, I might be missing one in there. 
But three in a row, I mean, four in a row is the best we've seen, I guess, except for maybe the UTEP teams, which won five in a row. And then maybe you got to go way, 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 way back. But NAU is being about as dominant as you can if we're just talking cross country right now. Okay, guys, we're going to try to talk to Vin actually this week. So look for that on the website. I sort of wonder, I mean, Vin had stepped down at Tracktown USA because he was the USATF president as well. And he's been sort of neutered from that job, removed by the board because the Justice Department was looking into whether there was any improprieties with the worlds being awarded to Eugene 2023. But it's interesting, the board has no problems with Max Siegel, you know, remaining as president. So this whole thing is, some people are saying it's a power play, whatever, nobody really knows what's going on. There's an arbitration hearing coming up on that. But Vin had to leave Tracktown USA, so he's not there. And now he's just an athletic director at Oregon. I mean, maybe he just wanted a new challenge. Does anyone wonder if there's like a falling out with Uncle Phil? You know, there's just all this stuff no one really knows about. Because I, I think Oregon Track... Uncle Phil still runs that thing, right? Behind the scenes, or like he gets what he wants. But I guess Vin really, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying, actually, guys. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's it would be the best thing to do is just to ask Vin about why he's doing this. I think it would be very, he should have some interesting things to say. We'll try to bring to that to you later this week. But we're not necessarily going to get the straightforward answer. Well, yeah, of course. But, you know, I'll, I'd like to hear what he has to say. Guy's a master salesman. I, I saw Ben at USA's and I was like, hey, Ben, you know, we'd love to talk to you. And he's like, I, I cannot talk about the arbitration hearing, like, legally. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, Ben's a good salesman, but that's a great skill. Everywhere this guy, I, we joke, you know, but some of this is somewhat true. He's the one guy who gets stuff done in track and field in America. He got Eugene, Oregon, the world championships. This tiny town out in the middle of nowhere in Oregon, they're hosting the world championships in track and field. I mean, that's just phenomenal. I guess some people would say, oh, well, he had Uncle Phil's checkbook. Well, other people could have had Uncle Phil's checkbook, and they never even thought of doing that. So he brought the world championships to Eugene. People want him to be USATF president because a lot of USATF sort of just seems to be peddling around besides what Vin's doing or what he touches. And there's just no reason to assume that this guy won't be very successful at Virginia. Yeah, but I do think it's interesting, Robert said, I mean— a lot of these programs, UVA has brought in Vin. I'm sure they're paying him a nice check. I'm sure that UNC is bringing, paying Chris Miltenberg a lot. And then Syracuse has been successful. And Notre Dame is now, you know, they won the DMR. They have the national champ in the 1500. They're a top team. One of those teams is going to be fourth or worse. And they are going to be ADs saying, hey, why can't you get it done? It's, it's going to be very interesting to watch that conference over the next couple of years. I don't think a lot of ADs care if you're fourth, as long as you get like top twenty in the and the and the nationals. It gives them some Sears points or whatever that thing's called. But you know, USATF they need to just put Vin back in. I mean, so USATF worried is worried about some bribery scandal, but but UVA, a major state university, isn't worried about it. They're 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 hiring Vin. So you know, unless there's charges, just let him do his job. But guys, before we end, I think there's a couple of interesting road race results from last week that we need to talk about, led by the Great North Run in Britain. Now, it's a point-to-point course, but Bridget Coast Guy runs 64-28. This is the fastest half marathon in history, correct, John? That is correct, Robert. Fastest ever by a woman. So the question I have is how fast is she going to run in, in, in Chicago? I mean, she's been on fire, John. Can you briefly tell people like how hot she's been? I mean, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I mean, the girl's been... Let's start with Chicago last fall. So that was her first major victory. I mean, actually, last spring in London, she was second behind Vivian Chariot in 20, spring of 2018. But then she wins Chicago last fall in 218.35. That's a personal best. This winter, she comes out to, to Houston. She wins that race, the Houston Half Marathon, 65.50. Then she goes and runs this Bahrain Night Half Marathon, which is a new race at 65.28. And then in London, that's the big one. She goes out, she wins that, defeats Vivian Chariot, defeats Mary Katani, just to feel the studs, runs 218.20. And that was a huge negative split. Remember, she broke Mary Katani's record for the fastest second half in a marathon. She ran that in under 67 minutes. So we, I mean, clearly she was very fit. Goes to Atlanta, won, wins Peachtree, breaks the course record there, gets a huge payday, 30-22. Uh, 
And now in the Great North Run, she runs the fastest half marathon ever. So I think my expectation, I think she was in shape to run 216 in London had she paced that thing properly. And in Chicago, I think if, you know, who knows if they're going to have a male pacemaker or not or someone for her to follow, but I think they need to bring Weldon Johnson out of retirement, Paula Radcliffe style. But I think Paula's course record is 217.18. I think that goes down. If the conditions are good, if the pacing's correct, I think we could see Brigitte Cosguy become just the second woman to run under 217 in the marathon in Chicago. Is the 217.18 the second fastest time ever still? No, the the second fastest time ever is Mary Katani, 217.01 in London in 2017. Well, my, I'm going to cease being relevant in the running world. If no longer I am the pacer for the fastest women's marathon time at the Chicago Marathon, please, Bridget, don't don't break the record. Don't break the record. But it's just pretty amazing running. I mean, what what she's doing, it, it's crazy because, you know, the 65, 66-minute half marathons by women used to be, I don't, I don't know, like very rare. And now they're happening all the time. And now we're 64, 28. Pretty crazy. Mo Farah wins this race every year. He did that as well. They kind of make it sure that he wins. They don't make it sure. There's always someone kind of close to him, usually. But 59.08, I mean, that's as good as you need for a marathon. He's still bringing it, training very well. Let's do a factual correction there. One year he raced Haile Gabbasaw, St. Canadese, and Bekele in this race. I mean, I don't think they make it easy for him to win every year. Remember when Bekele, that was one of the greatest races in history. Bekele fell back and then came on and shocked everybody. But the reason why he wins is he runs 59.07. Now, I know this is wind aided, but I don't think there was some ridiculous, huge, you know, tailwind helping these people. So both of them are in 6 6 shape. Chicago is going to be amazing. Um, it's just really exciting to, to see them. But there also, guys, was a 10K in the Czech Republic that really interested me. And the Burrell Grand Prix, winning time on the men's side, 27.02. Women's side, 29.57. Two women broke 30, and I've never heard of either one of them. Sheila Chep Karui of Kenya won in 29.57 with Dorcas Chepchumba second in 29.57. On the men's side, Jeffrey Kowetch, an unheralded 26-year-old with PBs of 27.18 from this year's race last year and 59.50 in the half marathon runs 27.02. So those are really fast road times and those that's a record eligible course. So I, I was trying to figure out like what's up here. Now, Sheila Chip Curry, who did win in 29.57, she was seventh in the world 5,000 last year or two years ago. She has a 14.54 PR, but she's 28 years old. I mean, that's pretty sick. She doesn't have the 10 case. The sad thing is you can't use this race to qualify for Worlds. So she doesn't have the 10,000 standard. So I guess assuming she's going to try to run the 5,000 at Worlds this year with the Kenyan trials coming up, right, this week. And I mean, and then the second placer who ran 29.57, the only PRs I can find for her are 15.24 and 68.19. It's crazy how fast some of these people run in the world. Brother. And Robert, third place, Nora Tanui, the steeplechaser. She got third in the Diamond League final in the steeplechase, and she goes out and runs 3rd DO7 for 10K. So that was a pretty impressive performance for her as well. John, nothing gets by you. This is why we love you. I was going to talk about it, you know, and I have her name bolted. To me, that is, you know, I'm telling Jenny to move up to the steeple because I think it's low-hanging fruit, but it's not really no low-hanging fruit. I mean, she's a 3007 flat 10,000-meter 10, runner in the steeple, and she's not even the lock for a medal. So... There's definitely some quality, you know, and I think that that sign, though, shows you it's not going to be a cakewalk for medals for Coburn or Fryricks. I know they went one, two, two years ago, but it's a lot. It seems like it's deeper this year and going to be tough for the medal there. I mean, I think they got a good shot at a medal, but I think there's four or five women that are, 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 are battling it out for three medals. Absolutely. I'm just shocked she ran this race. I mean, she has the Kenyan World Championship Trials. Like, they start tomorrow, and she's running a road 10K in the Czech Republic, like, four or five days before. That's kind of crazy to me. Oh, that's a good point. Maybe she's burning herself out. Maybe this is a good sign for 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 for, for Coburn and Fryricks. Well, Kenyan trials this week. I completely forgot about that. Like this season is nuts, and with the Kenyans changing their trials like two weeks before they were supposed to happen last month, I think it was a good idea. But like, hey, another track me to get excited about. Well, hey, and how about this? Arguably the greatest marathon or the the most dramatic marathon of 2019. The Japanese. Marathon Grand Championship 
aka the Japanese Olympic Trials, this Saturday, well, it's Sunday in Japan, Saturday night in the US. I mean, if you want a more dramatic race, you've got the Japanese, they love the marathon, they're obsessed with the marathon, they're hosting the Olympics, and this race is going to determine their Olympic team for the first time ever. How awesome is this, guys? Big thumbs up to the Japanese. I'm so excited. We should have led, we should have led the podcast with this. I'm so excited for this race. We're going to do a preview of it. They've gone, the Japanese themselves have gone to a trial style race. That's what the sport needs. Everybody needs to go to the trials and just the drama. Like you can't beat it. Yes. Every once in a while, somebody will trip or fall and not make the team. That's, that's sports. You know, I mean, there, there's fluke interceptions that prevent the best team from making the Super Bowl. So what? It makes it so exciting. And, you know, this is going to, now it's not a pure top three across the line. I think only the top two are guaranteed to go. Third spot, if you run some ridiculous time after the fact, you might be able to make it. It's like if you break the national record after the race, that's the only way to get on the team. So I think pretty much the top three are going to go. Well, that's maybe a perfect way to do it. That's what we should all do. You can have a caveat. If you're insane, you can do it and still make the team. But it's going to be really exciting. I assume there's going to be some way to figure out a way to watch it. So That better be. I mean, I definitely want to watch that race live. Saturday night is great timing. You know, get some, Here's what you do, guys. Get some friends over. Go go to the store, get some Sapporo beer, and uh, just sit around, or maybe order some ramen and watch it. What should be a fantastic race. Hopefully, there's a way to watch it, even if there's not one legally. Maybe, uh, well, I'm not going to encourage people to find an illegal stream. I just know that they exist out there in the world. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to watch this race. Suguru Sako is of the Nike Oregon Project. He's going to be one of the top guys. He broke the national record in Chicago last year. You also have uh, Yuta Shitara. Love watching that guy race. He basically just ran the Gold Coast Airport Marathon or the Gold Coast Marathon in Australia for fun, like as a training run. He was going to do like only 25 miles and then just decided to finish it. He won that. He ran 207. That was in July. And now he's coming back two months later to run these trials. So those are two that sort of the big heavy hitters on the men's side. But the depth is just way better than the US. Uh, you know, it's it's hard just to make the Olympic trials in Japan I think some of these guys would be, you know, all of them have the Olympic standard pretty much. Uh, well, it's, it's not entirely true. So I was going to say, yeah, Sarko doesn't have it yet because he hasn't run the time in the window, but this has gold label status. So whoever finishes in the top three will get the standard. Yeah, I want to see the preview just to see when I on paper to see how sick these fields are. Sugoro Sako, NOP guy. This shows how they leave no stone unturned. This, I think we, there was a message board thread on this, but... My one training partner when I lived in Fort Worth, Texas, Richard Garcia, podcast listener, he texted me and he's like, hey, hey, Osaka ran this half marathon in Dallas. And he ran a half marathon in Dallas last month, um, soloed it, like clearly just to get used to running in the heat because it's still very hot in Japan. Like the NOP does not mess around. These other guys talk about getting ready for the heat, da, 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 da. Galen Rupp is one of the best heat acclimated runners in the world. It's because... Th- because they practice this shit so i don't know what the weather forecast is is for tokyo this week but if it's hot expect him to be a factor i guess if it's cold expect him to be a factor no matter what expect him to be a factor but the nop isn't going to let something that some variable that is somewhat under your control affect you i just thought that was pretty cool that he went to a half marathon in dallas with no prize money and cleaned up well guys been quite a podcast i'm not sure if i've done anything to been that this week will have somebody's father calling me an unprofessional irresponsible hack and idiot but jenny simpson's dad if you're listening please reach out to us i guess that wow yeah that, that would probably be the best bet actually i didn't think about it it's often often what you gotta just when you have 90 minutes of talking live there's a lot of potential mindfuls I met Mr. Simpson last year at the Fifth Avenue Mile. He's like a college professor who's very praiseworthy of Let's Run. So unless Robert said something very, very, very offensive, I'm not sure he'd go to the boards and undo all the praise he gave me a year ago. But you never know. Yeah, and we tried this week to sort of make up to the JV runners by expanding the category just a little bit. So hopefully they're on our good side. Um, we know Jordan Hesse's dad loves us too. So it's good to hear that, that, that several parents like us. Seth Coleman may not be the biggest fan, but hey, he is listening. You know, that's what a lot of these talk show hosts say. They, hey, we don't care if you love you love us or hate us as long as you're listening. So, and if you are listening, folks, you need a pair of new shoes. Go to letsrun.com slash shoes. Best shoe review site out there, and you can save money as well. Speaking of JV runners, 
We've not discussed the Let's Run.com meetup that occurred this week. Jamin was in town. He said, hey, do you want to have a beer? And I said yes. And then we, I posted on the forums, anybody else want to join us? I'm not sure if the leaked audio will come out from that meeting or not. There was talk of somebody secretly recording it. So look for that in a few days. Antonio Brown wasn't at the meeting, was he? I hear that he's been up to that sort of thing. John, you're screwed. The Patriots have just shelled out money to Antonio Brown. Hopefully he'll get suspended this week. Cowboys, we're doing it the right way. We've never signed anyone who's like had guns, beaten, beaten anyone, done drugs, or anything like that. America's team, by the books. Yeah, Greg Hardy, never played for the Cowboys. You know, erase him from history. All right, guys. Thank you for the podcast. Robert, John, till next week.